violence experienced by its inhabitants from both South Vietnamese attacks and U.S. heavy bombardment during the years 1964 to 1975. Tin employs both historical as well as individual narrative in his illustration of this violence, describing experiences such as that of Brother Dick De Death, a family, a farmer whose family's home burned in the fires of Napalm, dropped from U.S. fighter planes in 1964. Two of Dick Dett's brothers later died from their injuries, while his elder sister was horribly burned. Here I'm quoting from, from this article. After her wounds had healed, both arms were stuck to her body at the armpits, making even such simple tasks as showering difficult. Her arms and hands were rendered almost useless. From Dick Dett's story, Tin goes on to describe the level, levels of suffering villagers from Chintry Village recounted in their interviews in both this issue as well as issue four of Searching for the Truth, stating, quote, the war between Vietnam and the United States left hundreds of villagers in Chintry sub-district homeless and caused severe food shortages. More than 100 villagers died meaningless deaths. Many were injured, while others were left physically and mentally disabled, end quote. Although there is no language of error or mistake present in this narration of Chintry Village, as it was in the description of in the description of destruction of Nhat Hun, Tian clearly illustrates the disregard of imperialist violence in Southeast Asia through this accounting of its human cost. Centering this loss of life and loss of life resources within a magazine dedicated to searching for the truth regarding the Cambodian genocide, Tian's article functions as a commentary on the historical continuities of the violences of the US empire and the violences of Khmer Rouge rule. In contradistinction to this previous article describing the perhaps not strongly indicting international culpability regarding historical violence in Cambodia, in her article of May 2000's issue entitled Temporal Jurisdiction 1970-1975 to be Solved, Elizabeth Van Schack prevents a trenchant argument against the expansion of temporal jurisdiction in the not yet commenced international tribunal. In her argument against the expansion of the court's jurisdiction to include crimes committed outside the marriage period of 1975 to 1979, Schack contends that although, quote, Cambodia's modern history is characterized by interventions by foreign powers in Cambodian affairs, it cannot be disputed that the human rights violations that occurred during these periods paled in comparison with the abuses that took place during the Khmer Rouge era, end quote. Thus, although the U.S. is credited with dropping many, this is actually, thus, although, quote, the United States is credited with dropping many thousands of bombs, actually millions of bombs, on Cambodia in violation of its own international internal law during the Vietnam War, and although after Vietnam's 1979 invasion, members of the international community continue to treat the ousted Khmer Rouge regime as a legitimate government of Cambodia, and, quote, even as the evidence of the extreme brutality of that regime mounted, Schacht decisively states that it is the most serious violations of international law committed by the Khmer Rouge alone that have offended all of humanity and thus deserve an undivided international reckoning. Schacht's rote recitation of the violences of U.S. empire both preceding and following the violences of Khmer Rouge rule is an apt example of Yoniyama's discussion of the forgetting of forgetfulness, a partial acknowledgement of imperialist violence that functions as an empty gesture. The although used here to frame Schacht's narrative illustrates activation of the trope of exceptionalism by which such imperialist crimes, although recognized, are always already justified. Thus, U.S. imperialist violence becomes firmly entrenched in the past, wiped away from the contemporary moment, and ultimately deemed insignificant in regards to the proceedings of the present. Schacht's hierarchical assessment regarding historical violence in Cambodia reflects Haitian scholar Michelle Rodriguez's theorizing regarding formulas of erasure and banalization trivialization in regards to history. Rodriguez's <coughs> assertion that continual forgetting and silencing of the Haitian Revolution has been based on a highlighting of Haiti's fate itself parallels the ways in which a historical narrative of tragedy regarding Cambodia erases and elides international complicity and imperial violence. Hegemonic commemorations of the genocide is a discrete event and preoccupations with the barbarism of Cambodia's former and current authoritarian regimes function to alight both the violence that precipitated the genocide, as well as the devastating effects of the U.S.'s and many of its Cold War allies' embargo on Cambodia for over a decade post-genocide. Such a discourse of tragedy fixes the event of the genocide at the expense of a reckoning with interconnected histories of colonialism and imperialism in Southeast Asia, 
And such a discourse of tragedy also consequently fixes models of Western juridical reconciliation as the solution for the violence and trauma of the genocide's afterlife. Such models of juridical reconciliation are not in and of themselves necessarily problematic, but as we can see with Schacht's article in Searching for the Truth, the predominant usage of these models functions as a smokescreen for the antecedents and afterlives of the violence of the genocide. The current International Criminal Tribunal in Cambodia functions to discreetly assign individual blame and accountability for the harm of historical violence, masking the entanglements of historical and ongoing structures of colonial, imperial, and regime violence. DC Camp's evidentiary purpose in regards to the International Criminal Tribunal does make it unique as an archival institution, concretizing its claims to accountability. However, such explicit evidentiary investment also posits limits in such a function, as these two articles illustrate, including the inability for the archival institution's notions of juridical justice to account for a war crimes such as the U.S. bombings in Cambodia. The International Tribunal's bounded temporal jurisdiction from 1975 to 1979 perpetuates a continuing discreteness around the historical event, resulting in an encapsulation of the genocide as well as its documentation, unable to take into account conflicting epistemologies, conditions, and structures of power for grounding the kinds of experiences my father details at the very beginning of this presentation. And although it is undeniable that DC Camp's presence, function, and mission is invaluable in documenting the Cambodian genocide and making transparent histories of violence as a part of grafting of dealing with the past. The archival institution's spotlighting of dominant historical narratives in the genocide's event and tragedy functions to reify static histories and memories of violence in Cambodia that may unfortunately result in the simultaneous forgetting of others. This is where my second archival case might intervene. I was introduced to Bhangira Banas' 2009 art documentary installation, Bomb Ponds, a few years ago when a colleague of mine sent me a link to the installation's information page on the Asia Society of New York's website. From there, I followed the installation's movements, both backwards and forwards, tracing its provenance, its origins, and documentary context, as well as its trajectory of exhibit, or perhaps what we could posit as points in its particular life cycle in our critical study suite. Bob Pons is now on exhibit at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, an acquired collection whose physical exhibition is complemented by public access via an online collection catalog through the Guggenheim's website, as well as exhibition in photographic form with no contextual information on Bobby Rathana's personal website, which I have a screenshot of here. Although Rathana's art documentary installation might not necessarily be an archive in the traditional sense, and here I'm referencing A. Jacobson's <coughs> and Archival Studies view of archives as natural accumulations and archivists as custodians of such material, Bomb Ponds and Rathana's larger body of work readily lend themselves to readings as records or registries of historical violence, and thus function as a generative comparative case for DC Camp's online archival presence. Although Rathana's website does not purport to be a digital archive, as a working, growing collection of his various exhibitions and work, Rathana's website serves many functions of online archives, including documentation, tr doc documentation transparency, and accountability. Rathana's body of work can also be read as a non-traditional archival collection when refracted through more contemporary formulations of archival operations through documentation and transparency, as well as deconstructed conceptualizations of the archive, which read cultural texts as repositories of histories of violence trauma. In contrast to DC Camp's more singular investments in accountability and documentation, Rathana's website, Rathana's website varies for documentary collections to fulfill such archival purposes through their physical documentation of various dimensions of Cambodian everyday life and the resonances with historical events of Cambodia's past. But Athena's Clamber's trial collection of photographs especially invokes a different kind of affect from that solicited in viewing DC Camp's websites and materials. Rather than a focus on the spectacular violence of the event of genocide and the function of the tribunal as a reconciliatory force, but Athena's collection of photographs focuses on the quotidianness of the trials, i.e. their many shots of microphones and filming equipment, for example, as you see in this photograph, consequently addressing a process by which violence becomes enfolded into the everyday. Like Dina Das's discussion of the violence of the partition of India in 1947, 
1947 for the massacre of Sikhs following the assassination of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in 1984 coming to take hold in the moving present. Ratana's photographs construct a different kind of archive of violence, one that gestures towards multiple truths as well as interconnectivities, reminding us simultaneously of the complexities of violence that cannot be captured by binary models of justice, as they also remind us of the ways to which historical violence comes to structure our daily lives. Ratana's offhand comments to me regarding this particular exhibit also gestured towards Yoni on this question regarding how we might, quote, fill the void of knowledge without reestablishing yet another regime of totality and universal truthfulness, end quote. Ratana's remarks regarding his intentions for the photographs to mock, to display the dimension of artifice in the proceedings, to contrast these scenes with what the world expects, reflects the ways in which this exhibit functions as a provocation for a self-critical look at the tribunal. The seriousness of the tribunal's hegemonic framing becomes undercut by Ratana's pragmatic and mundane scenes, a sense of something close to tediousness hinting at Ratana's commentary regarding the ineffectiveness of the tribunal as a medium for reckoning with memories of the past and a generation of reflexive accountability for the present. In what could be read as its own documentation of landscape histories, Ratana's bomb ponds exhibit, in turn, seeks to make visible the presences, as well as absences, of U.S. imperialist violence in Cambodia today. Bomb Ponds consists of a series of landscape photographs, as well as a short video documenting the event in afterlives of the U.S. carpet bombing in Cambodia from 1964 to 1973. Ratana's landscape photography captures the after effects and residues of the bombings on the Cambodian countryside, depicting the absence and presence of this history of U.S. imperialism through still images that show the incorporation of bombing sites, these craters, into various natural settings, such as rice fields, rubber plantations, clearings, Forests. The short documentary video, which I'll play a clip of, that accompanies Rathana's series of photographs readily available on YouTube, he recently uploaded all of his video to YouTube, gives both historical context to the meaning of such landscapes, as well as an experiential dimension through testimonies from survivors of the bombings. So I'm going to cross my fingers and hope this works. So I'm going to like play the first five minutes, so you get a sense of.
คยคายทศศาสตร์กรอบไปผมปีมาตั้งแต่มือถึงไปขมายมือจานปีไปจึงรอบตัวมือรอบมันออกแล้วสาวตั้งแต่จานปีรู้ปีไปห้าสิบปีหายมือมันออกมือสอบยิ่งที่ปราจุงนั้นนั้นไปจีจุนจานหามหาสลักกาไข่เต็มน่าจะจานกว่าหรือจุงแต่คือยิ่งกว่าพระพุทธศาสนาจะหาตัวกว่าออกชัวร์เลยยมเดาละอันนั้นเกี่ยวอันนี้ก็เป็นท่านอาจารย์ท่านเป็นตียังต้องรอดูเป็นโรคไปยังรับยังยังยังยังยังยังต้องให้พูดให้พูดให้ทำลุงทำตามไปนั่นแหละแต่ก่อนไปที่ไหนมองมองนู่นตู้ไหนมองไปหาเพื่อนเตี้ยไปมองตู้ดูโซ่สุดท้ายแต่ยังก่อนไปทุเรศมองดูโซ่ปูทุเรศมองตุ่มล้วนบริษัทจุดยืนนี่ไว้ยังสุดท้ายไปบ้านที่นั่นมาล้วนกึ่งออกจุดใดมองแล้วชนะคนจุดใดต่อยี่ไหมแต่คนนั้นคือสมเด็จอาชนะสังตุสมเด็จที่คนนั้นคือได้ไปอ่ะทำไมแบบตัวเอาเยอะมากคนนั้นตัวที่จิตใจบอกตัวนี้คือใจมือจับจนคนตายตายรู้สักกันยังเจ้าเจ้าตัวนี้ตีไปไหมตีไปไหมก็ไปไหมถูกไหมแต่ตีไปไหมมันตีก็ยืนตายแบบคนจะไปแบบคนหลังนะเรื่องหลังมวยมวยสะใจมาชื่อบนนั้นมาโมจงลำพอตั้งตัวบ่าวเป็นตั้งแต่ว่าเรื่องที่บ่าวที่ยันตามเคยได้บ้างไหมบ้างสำหรับพอตัวไปนี่ก็ไปดูกับไปกับโมจงสิต่อไปนั้นจะเอาเงินเยอะทั้งเท่าใส่ยังไงยังไงอ่ะเอาเงินประจานจ่ายถึงพบคนตามพบเวลาชุดเซลล์กับไปชูกามองไปซ้ำทางไหนกับไปกูเรียนเรียนปุ่นนะมองไปซ้ำอะไรบ้างตอนนี้อะไรเรื่องสาวเห็นติดตีมันนั่งมองเรื่องเป็นตามเกลือแซ่สะดกูสะดกไปออกมองไปซ้ำทางติดอะไรบ้างไปดอกมาแล้วกูไปไหมคงจะเล่นกูคือเธอหาผู้หาคงจะงออะไรตัวนี้ตามเดียวกันเป็นเงินกูก็หาให้เงินเจ้าท่าน So this is actually on YouTube if you want to watch the whole it's it's a little over 20 minutes it's a full video So I'm just speaking a little bit about how Repinac came to put together this particular exhibition So while he was photographing rubber plantations in Kumbhongjang province in early in early 2009, in an effort to trace the residues of French colonialism in Cambodia, Ratana had his first encounter with a bomb pond, one of the sometimes massive, almost always perfectly circular craters left behind by the US bombing campaigns of the 60s and 70s. Curious regarding what his camera had captured, Ratana asked local villagers about the craters pockmarking Bochan's rubber fields, and he came to learn stories regarding a history of violence that he had up to that point Ignorance of ignorant of. He told me that the memory of his ignorance haunted him for a year. His, the memory of his ignorance regarding his intertwined histories and the image of the bomb pond haunted him for a year. And in late 2009, when he returned to Cambodia, Rapana set out to document this forgotten history of U.S. carpet bombings in this bomb pond series of landscape photographs spanning ten different provinces along the eastern Cambodian-Vietnamese border. Among his various collections, bomb ponds is an especially apt example of the potentialities of Southeast Asian American studies known when and land outlined in the guest editor's introduction to the 2012 Southeast Asian American Studies special issue of the journal Positions. In their introductory article, the authors outlined Southeast Asia as an epistemic formation tracing, quote, new methodological and epistemological configurations regarding Southeast Asia as post-colonial imaginary and neo-imperial geography, end quote, provoked by, quote, recent critical moves in Asian American studies and U.S. ethnic studies towards interdisciplinarity and transnationality as necessary to the study of historical formations and their ongoing renewal of the U.S. empire, end quote. Similar to emerging scholarship that turns away from vested interests and representation towards the, quote, particular residences of secret wars refugee archives of feeling and the recursive traces of both, end quote, Rathana's work enacts another world at the juncture of Asian American and Asian studies. 
Following a feeling, the affective pull of the ghost, Rathana's bond bonds captures the recursiveness of imperialist violence while turning away from a trafficking and spectacle. This series of photographs, both haunting and serene, brings the past quietly, but also profoundly into the present, seizing the past into present before it can be wiped free. Using a photographic method that is meant to capture the perspective of someone passing by such bonding landscapes many years after war, but Athena's Bon Pons paradox paradoxically reflects both elements of remembrance and forgetting that constitute the dialectics of memory and history making. His series of photographs thus emote a kind of everydayness in parallel to their haunting temporality. The photographs appear to pre prevent a separation of foreground and background, enveloping the historical event slash site of bombing into its contemporary and post-war context. In doing so, Rathana's art documentary installation disrupts various colonial logics and mechanisms, such as the deployment of the exception, illustrating the potentialities of alternative forms of memory work to explicate and manifest the wounds of imperialism. Rathana's installation has the potential to function as a different kind of archival evidence, as a record that extends beyond bureaucratic enumeration and homogenization, drawing our attention to the effects and experiences of U.S. violence in Cambodia. Rathana's archives, this body of work in these various documentary mediums, has the potential to support accountability and transparency, doing so less in a critical sense, and more so in terms of social and public accountability, reckoning with cyber histories through these multi-dimensional stagings of documentation that refuse official forms of forgetting. Responding to the bureaucratic power of archival records, the power that naturalizes the violence of colonialism and imperialism via administrative documentation, Rathana turns to the visual and auditory to be affective for this archive of violence. Through his body of ongoing work, Rathana continues to gesture towards remembering, utilizing the power of archival materials to document past violences and their afterlives. And as work that highlights one particular junction of Asian American and war for Cambodian Americans, as well as others in the diaspora, Bon Pon stands in stark contrast to those continuing and shifting forms of Cold War logics that he articulates, which form one protracted afterlife of the Cambodian genocide. Here, I am careful to note the multiplicity of afterlives post-genocide, and would be cautious to note that the specific afterlife to which I refer here needs to reference a dominant narrative of the Cambodian genocide as event that travels within the American imaginary. This popular deployment of Cambodia in the afterlife of the genocide manifests as both non-narrative, as well as spectacle, and U.S. remembrances, and functions to foreground notions of American exceptionalism, as well as distance in U.S. as well as distance from histories of violence in Cambodia. Following Kim's discussion of Asian American cultural production that troubles the dominant Nihi Lodge's pervading narrations of the historical past and present, Rathana's bomb ponds, however, intervenes into the hegemonic epistemological valence that continues to generate new knowledge or translations after the end of the genocide's historical life or eventness, persistently gesturing towards the transnational dimension of historical violence in Southeast Asia. As one representation of non-spectacular violence, as a representation of violence that illustrates its embeddedness in the everyday, Bon Pons reflects the continuity and shifting forms of imperialist violence and its remembrance of forgetting in Cambodia. In doing so, Randy Rathana's Bon Pons functions to disarticulate the power of this, protracted, of this particular protracted afterlife of the Cambodian genocide, and subsequently functions to re-articulate those logics that would otherwise naturalize the U.S. Empire. In late September 2015, I was fortunate enough to be part of a small group, myself, three of my friends, and two Rathana's colleagues, to accompany Bandi Ratna on a trip back to Leech Moon Village Mimo District in what is now the Bon Pon province in Cambodia. It had been six years since Ratna had first traveled here in 2009 to photograph the district's rubber fields. Six years since Ratna had first stumbled upon the craters that would eventually inspire his Bon Pon's exhibit. In Leech Lu, our group first met up with the village chief at his home where we were invited to have lunch. And after lunch, we traveled by minivan with the chief to visit several rubber and cassava plantations in the district. Walking through, consequently also the title of Rathana's 2009 rubber plantation exhibit, which I had a few photographs of, of earlier, walking through, 
The photographic images that I had seen numerous times was a surreal experience. Actually seeing up close, being with, standing in the craters, looking down into the hole dug deep in the middle of one bomb crater by local people searching for scrap metal. At the time, I remember looking down and further down into that hole and was reminded of scenes from Ricky Hunt's Machine Movie Catch, and I couldn't actually find this scene when I was Googling. The space dug deep in that crater in Kwong Bong Kwang, reminiscent of the initial nation of prison in the 2011 film for the black American soldier whose plane had been shot down. Reminiscent of that hole in the ground prison guarded by rural children caught between the violences of US imperialism and the militarism of Khmer Rouge and Lano regimes. The hole at the bottom of that crater in Bong Kwang was deep, so deep I imagined at the time that if I fell in, as my good friend Lat commented, that it would have been quite difficult to get myself back out. As we walked the landscape, Revna marveled at how much had changed in just six years, the presence of craters becoming less and less visible as the region became more and more developed, as the craters began to be filled in to build new houses and to be used for agricultural industry. The craters he filmed in rice fields in 2009, Revna mused, most likely no longer existed. For the most part, the bomb craters were too expensive to be completely filled in, and landowners had local farmers plant rubber trees in cassava in the craters themselves. The rubber trees never breaking formation. Crater or no crater, the trees planted in linear fashion, as we see in the photograph of the dough we took when we were in the But the banana trees, and I apologize, I didn't get a picture of the banana trees in the boat, but I did when I was in in a, in Ratanakiri. They're everywhere in these craters. But the banana trees, some perhaps purposely planted, but a good number of them growing in the craters of their own accord, sprouted in no linear formation. When I pointed them out, Lett told me about an old Cambodian folk tale associated with banana tree Lett's mother once recounted, a tale that explained how banana trees are meant to be a sign of haunting. I remember, at the time, that Lett's words gave me pause. Haunting, I thought, a very, very thing. After the rubber and cassava fields, we traveled with the chief to nearby Mong village, one of the first heirs of the Indochina War, a village the Americans had mistakenly bombed in 1964 and once again in 1970. In Mong, we spoke with an elderly woman who led us to one long crater and then another. Craters not used in mass agricultural production this time, but rather by local folks for small subsistence gardens. We met up with one elderly man, a very old man, who spoke about the American bombings and the loss of his family about the mistaken bombing of his village in 1964, and about the bombings that were not acknowledged as a mistake in 1970. We visited the stone plaque you see here in the village, written with a couple of bullet holes and lettering beginning to rub off, the plaque representing Prince Sienna's commemoration of the 1964 bombing, an American apology for this year. The people we met that day told stories, told us that the bombings were not supposed to be of places inhabited by people, but that they inevitably work. The stories people chose to tell me that day in the boat reminded me of other stories I had heard over lunch, dinner, meetings with people in Cambodia. Spontaneous stories that emerged, oftentimes in no linear fashion, blind hegemonic silences. These stories of, from Cambodians of multiple generations, including Cambodians from my generation as well, the relating of stories from their friends and family regarding the US bombing campaigns, regarding airplanes seemingly bombing fully inhabited villages with intent, purposefully targeting people's makeshift bomb shelters, stories regarding the terror of planes circling overhead all the time, belie any such notion that the violence of the US empire was just an exception, a justifiable mistake. These remembrances, these living landscape histories and parallel public memories disarticulate discrete narratives of tragedy that signal an inevitability regarding violence in Cambodia that does not take into account historical agency and power of international actors. Such remembrances perform the work of what Benjamin, as cited by Yomiyama, considers a historical materialist writing of history, one that, quote, takes into account that which has been omitted from universal history's inventory of happenings, a reclaiming of missed opportunities and unfulfilled promises in history as well as unrealized events that might have led to a different present, end quote. Through making legible the unequal and racialized rubrics of morality and value that undergirded the hot, cold war in Southeast Asia, these remembrances, quote, free the oppressed past in the history of empire that is made to appear as if it unfolds through time naturally and automatically, end quote. Like my 
father's contradictory narrative, as well as Ravana's treatment of the transnational dimension of Cambodia's histories of violence, these unofficial sites of memory rewrite a binary narrative that obscures international complicity in the events of the Cambodian genocide. These 